Um, hi. Um, yeah. So uh, you know, I, I'm as uh, introduced. I'm Nick Haber, assistant professor here at the Graduate School of Education, Computer Science. My group does a combination of AI education and their intersection. We share a stage here with with Catalin. Um, and let's see if this one works. Whoa! It vibrates too. That's wild. Okay. Um, I, this is the fanciest clicker I've ever had. Um, you're gonna love it. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, so so what uh, what we're talking about is a bit different when you what you um, what you just heard. Uh, it's not a, not a strict partnership per se, but um, uh, but teaming up uh, with education technology um, and and I think um, right. I mean, as education gets increasingly enmeshed with technology, education technology, AI in particular, um, it's I think it's really valuable to develop these these sorts of teamings to try to. Um, get good things out there into the world. A lot of what my lab has focused on um, has has been in teaming up with um, with technically focused private industry labs uh, in order to build open source tooling um, for uh, for better AI reasoners. Something that is, I think, you know, fundamental importance uh, in the application of AI to, to education. Um, so with uh, uh, labs like uh, Synth Labs, Nvidia, and uh, very nicely named, not bad AI. Um, we, we've made a variety of um, open source tools in order to uh, make these better reasoners. And I should say that with these sorts of, uh, with this kind of teaming up, um, I, I really think that like the, the PhD students here um, win a lot. So right, in each of these cases, Violet, uh, Sun, and, and Eric were really the bridge between um, these private industry labs and, and Stanford in order to make these, these things happen. Um, and right, they get access to the know-how uh, of these these industry labs as well as, um, and this isn't really to be understated too much, the, the computational resources that that uh, these groups have in order in order to make this work happen. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to talk about uh, the work with with Catalina and I today. And um, yeah, so fun fact: Catalina and I have known each other for now like twelve years, which is terrifying. Um, this is uh, this is a picture of one of our our, our first. Uh, projects together, uh, the Autism Glass Project. Uh, the idea was uh, we, we put uh, AI on uh, the, you know, that fun tool, Google Glass, for those of you who remember it, um, to use as a learning device for kids with autism. Um, uh, Catalina was a first year undergraduate when we were starting out with this stuff, uh, and I was a graduate student turned, turned postdoc. Um, you know, he's always wearing facial hair, so you can't tell he's like 20 in that shot. But right, I mean, right, this he goes way back, and we go way back with this. Uh, but but this this uh, particular project is for another day. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about, and and Catalina will then follow up a lot more about um, uh, our our work together at, with Ello. And and so right, full disclosure here, uh, I'm an advisor at Ello, um, and a lot of what we're we're going to be talking about today is in my capacity as an advisor uh, at Ello, um, and you know we, we translate basic research in, into that. Um, but uh, um, so right, there's sort of me at Stanford and me at Ello, different people. Um, but uh, um, but so right, I think it's a really interesting uh, uh, it's a really interesting story of how we're able to take basic research in both AI and best practice in education and turn it into really cool learning tools um, for kids. And and I'll also at this point I guess let Catalina take it from here. Yeah, cool. All right. Uh, yeah, so very simply put, right, what we're trying to do is put together the pieces of uh, world's first complete AI tutor for young kids. In some ways, it's sort of the foundational challenge of edtech, right, um, uh, or, or sort of the holy grail. And our, our sense is that to unlock this vision, uh, we need world-class talent at the intersection of AI and learning science and learning design, right? Um, and that's exactly what the LO team is. And I think what sort of Nick in, in his role on our team uh, represents. So I'll give you guys a little bit of context for sort of how we got here and then uh, share some of the examples um, for, uh, you know, how we bring science coming either from the machine learning or the learning science uh, side into product development to ultimately, yeah, build a tool to try to benefit kids. Um, so the story of Allo actually starts with my co-founder, Elizabeth Adams. Uh, she's a clinical child psychologist. Uh, and uh, during COVID in 2020, she was stuck at home with her daughter, uh, struggling to learn to read on Zoom, which, uh, you know, you can imagine um, was just a really, really hard challenge. Um, and we realized very quickly that Elizabeth wasn't alone with that challenge. Um, uh, Lily was struggling, but so were 
I mean, just tons of kids during the pandemic. In the US, 69% of fourth graders are unable to read at level as of sort of nation's report card in 2022. It's a massive problem globally. And if you think about it, you learn to read and then you read to learn. It's really the foundation of all other learning. So if you sort of haven't mastered it by the end of fourth grade, things are gonna get really hard, right? And so um, Ello was a product to initially just help out Lily and kids like Lily. So the idea is it's an AI reading tutor in the shape of an elephant, as you've guessed, um, who listens to you read out loud using speech perception, helps you when you get stuck, motivates you to keep going, and then you know awards you stars and prizes and um, inspires a love for reading. So let's talk a little bit about how to build such a thing, right? Um, first thing you need is to be able to understand kids, right? The, 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 the right technology for being able to engage them is natural language in this instance. Um, but the challenge is that sort of everything out there just didn't work for understanding kids. And so um, we did what one does right in that situation, I guess, right? Which is look at, well, what is you know, what, is, what does the science have to offer? Well, there's a bunch of um, models that came out recently. There's one that works with um, um, uh, self-supervised learning. Um, that seems like a really good fit for what we're trying to do. And so let's go look at who brought this thing and try to bring them in. And that's exactly what we did, right? So uh, Mike Lowley um, basically became the advisor and uh, then we hired Henry to like go build uh, wave to vec for child speech and beat everything else out there at child speech perception. Um, now let's go to the learning science side, right? We stand on the shoulders of giants, obviously. Um, you can look at you know, reading instruction as sort of a topic and say, well, you know, Scarborough's reading rope since 2001 sort of tells us that word recognition and language comprehension uh, together make uh, for good interwoven reading instruction, which means that you have to teach word recognition in context. And so the way that we do that is through a specific type of book called a decodable, right? It's basically uh, a book where you can use the phonics skills that you've learned and just apply them directly to read all of the words, which you know in English otherwise tends to be a pretty hard challenge. Um, and so we have our own basically phonics scope and sequence. And in the beginning, you know, this is sort of, ironically, this is a, quite a recent movement in the US and sort of shifting everything back over to science of reading and phonics based decodable instruction. Um, but as a result, there just wasn't that much content available. So we tried buying books and using other people's books, um, but uh, discovered quite quickly that it was hard to scale up a pedagogically sound reading app that way. So we needed our own content. Uh, and of course, I mean, we looked around and we're like, well, AI image generation language models, there should be something that we can do here, right? And so we've been trying to bend the uh, LLMs to the task of story generation, or we had been at the time. Um, but of course, this isn't just like, you know, write any book, chat GPT style sort of, you know, um, any content flies social media generation. It's actually trying to produce pedagogically sound books that are constrained to, you know, phonemically informed vocabulary lists, um, ideally the interests of the student and their skills at their specific level. And so um, that's where we first started to turn to Nick and say, hey, you did some work in this area and sort of basically repeat the same story. So yeah, do you want to tell us how we did that? Yeah, so, um, right, I mean, so, so to put my, like, Stanford researcher hat back on for a bit, I mean, to give a little context um, for, for this, um, my lab has for some time been thinking a lot about how generative AI should really interact with, with people. And we didn't think in the context of story generation to start. We were actually starting, uh, this is like 2021, 2022, in, in the context of, of code generation, right? Um, you know, there's there's this kind of standard paradigm in generative AI, which is that you think about what you want, you turn that into a prompt, and a magical thing comes out, right? Um, and and if you think about how people code, um, uh, it's very different, right? When when you code anything serious, right, um, you might come up with some initial spec. Um, it might be kind of fuzzy. You start to plan. Uh, you draw a diagram. You draw a flowchart. You figure out class structures, right? You break the problem into subproblems. You start to implement. As you do that, maybe you figure out, you know, not only how you should be making things, but what exactly it is that you want to make, right? It's this very messy back and forth process between these high-level artifacts, these mid-level artifacts like diagrams, plans, things like that, and 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 the actual code. Um, 
and and we wanted to make a generative AI tool that actually worked like that. And so um, we made uh, Parcel, which is a Harry Potter pun. And the um, the, the basic idea, right, is that you, you make um, it's so that an AI system or a human can take coding problems and decompose them into smaller subproblems. And uh, then a human or the AI system can implement parts of the subproblems and how they're stitched back together, decomposing uh, uh, the, the problem and so on. And it turns out that this, this actually um, leads to considerable um, accuracy improvements in, in code generation and um, can uh, greatly increase control and authorship of, of coding. And the same is really then the case for um, for, for story generation at a high level, right? When, when, we, when we make stories, um, we don't simply like think of a story idea and, and then write, right? I mean, that, that's maybe part of the creative process, but you also outline, you also, um, you also think about character outlines and sketches, right? You, you um, think about how plots come together and are interwoven. Um, it's this really complex process in which a variety of intermediate artifacts are, are made. And, and what we wanted to do was to, to make systems um, that could allow human authors with generative AI to have really precise control over what they're generating um, and, and, and thereby make much better and more pedagogically sound stories. And I'll hand it back to Catalina. Yeah, cool. Um, and so it's similar to the way Nick was describing it earlier with the um, sort of PhD student example, right? Like in this case, the PhD student uh, basically worked at Allo. Um, they're actually somebody who Nick and I worked with before in our in our time at Stanford. Um, yeah, and, um, and and together we built this pipeline, um, and they were basically advised by Nick in doing it, um, and uh, and essentially built the world's largest library of fully decodable books. I mean, it's sort of a fun fact. If you look at largest kids' book publisher, they put out 600 books in a year, and we're like, all right, we can we can beat that in six months um, using human in the loop AI tool. And then if you peer inside one of these books, I mean, they're really pedagogically sound uh, experiences. Um, we're now at the point where we can actually turn that into unlimited generation. So imagine you've got a five-year-old uh, in front of you, and they're struggling uh, with the blended SH sound, something like that, that S in H make shh, okay? Uh, and they like sea creatures. All right, we're going to make up a story about sharks and shrimp swimming in shallow waters and practice that right then and there. Um, so uh, um, that's, um, that's where it's headed. Um, so what's next after this? Um, I should say, we, um, it's sort of a, 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 a small update, but we just um, essentially got a, um, a, a big unannounced grant to rebuild the next generation of Allo from the ground up as an, an app where the AI controls the UX rather than the other way around and truly untether the experience. And so our goal is um, to build essentially first truly personalized learning companion where we can steer dialogue end to end, uh, and uh, and an agent autonomously moves through a learning path defined by curriculum, based on what a student is learning and uh, you know and, and and tracking according to a learner profile. Um, the same way that we did with the other pieces, we sort of stand on the shoulders of giants here, right? There's there's a lot of work that Nick's lab and other groups have done um, on in in the AI agent space that. Um, yeah, uh, including most recently at, at, at iClear um, that we're looking at and, and, and considering taking inspiration from and building upon. Um, and we think that's sort of the right way of going about it. And uh, yeah, and then piecing together all of the pieces um, of an of a complete AI tutor. Um, let's just remember that the reason that we do this right at the end of the day is that even it's just kind of mind blowing for me to to think that that's the case, but like even probably right now, there are like tens of thousands of kids reading to their elephants out there, <laughs> which um, which is just a really, 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 really fun fact. And so, um, you know, we have at this point no over a million books read. Um, there's there's a there's a level of real scale coming to this, which, as Dora said, is is something that probably is better achieved in industry. Um, but it wouldn't have been possible without the without the academic partnerships and and, and sort of inspiration that got us to this point. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm excited for what's next. 
Okay, now it's your turn. So I think here we've been hearing about how partnerships can do both, be an amazing place to learn more in this, uh, where researchers can kind of benefit and uh, learn from the scale that that's allowed and the penetration into schools and into with students that's allowed. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, and that's one side of it. And the other is just the partnership that then feeds in to, to more powerful tools. So what we'd like to do now is just have some uh, conversations at your table. If there are only a couple of you at one, join in with other ones. We have a couple of questions up here just to help you get going on this. Questions of what led you to this session, what best practices can you glean from this session. But we'd also love you to think a bit about what's a game-changing AI and education idea that could be tested through this kind of collaboration or built through this kind of collaboration. So the rest of this session is for you to, to talk to each other. And thank you. Give, please give uh, the panel a, a round of applause. And uh, we'll, we'll turn it back over to you.